This is Metrosource Minis, the official podcast of Metrosource Magazine and home of short-form interviews with your favorite personalities from the LGBTQ world and beyond. Quick, fun, and informative, it's Metrosource on the go. Out and proud since 1990. Well, listen to that applause. Well, hello, hello, hello. This is Metrosource Minis. I'm your host, Alexander Rodriguez writer for Metro Source and queen of the podcast. You better sissy that walk, girl. Today we are chatting with the fabulous Randy Barbado and Fenton Bailey as creators of the RuPaul's Drag Race franchise with versions in seven countries and counting and more and more and co-founders of the multi-platform media company behind some of the most trailblazing queer content of the 21st century. The two have been uplifting and giving a platform to underrepresented voices in the LGBTQ plus community for 30 plus years. Beyond bringing some of the world's most Talented queens to fame on Drag Race, Randy and Fenton take it a step further by giving many the opportunity to establish themselves further as brands through chart-topping shows, podcasts, musical records, across World of Wonders, robust collection of platforms, which include On Demand, uh, Presents Plus, of course, uh, with subscribers in every territory worldwide, YouTube channel Wow Presents, World of Wonder Records, and more. The two are also behind award-winning documentaries and films that give voice to the members of the LGBTQ plus community. And what better way to sell Celebrate Pride, then with a little tea session with this dynamic duo, please welcome Randy Barbado and Fenton Bailey. Hi. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. I feel so old. I <laughs> want to make one comment about something you said because please do. We're not we're not the creators of RuPaul. We're not the creators of RuPaul's Drag Race. It takes a village, people. It takes a village, people. And, and there are so many amazing people who have worked, including RuPaul, on it from day one. So I, I just needed to... Uh, that is very true. And I, I just want to add to Randy's thing about how old we are. I am drinking... <laughs> I'm drinking tea right now, and I'm drinking from my Shady Pines mug. <laughs> so... I love that drinking tea. Well, and you know, also, um, I don't even know where to begin because the credits and projects uh, read longer than the CVS receipt. And so, oh. when you look at the the expanse of content that you've both uh, had your hands in, um, it makes me feel old because I'm like, oh my god, yeah, I remember that. Um, and how it's changed uh, LGBTQ plus representation in in the media um, is just astounding. But I want to know. I want to go back to. I want to know what piece of entertainment, was it a TV show, was it a movie, something that you could remember as a kid that gave you that first kind of buzz that, hey, you know what, I want to be a storyteller, I want to get into the biz. Well, you know, I for me, it goes like, it goes way back to last century. It's when I saw the uh, the Batman uh, TV, the, the TV version of Batman and Robin. Because, um, you know, I, I love DC Comics and I love all those serious movies and the very intense violence and what have you. But I think seeing Batman and Robin on TV in 1966 was really inspirational in the sense that it was the campus thing, actually campus thing ever made, I think, perhaps, yeah. apart from Drag Race. Um, and it really did inspire me because nothing was really speaking to me before that. Uh, plus, you know, the tight pants, you know, the, the spandex d didn't oh, hurt no. either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It made me want to get into TV. Yeah. <laughs> Randy, and, uh, and how about you? Uh, for me, I think it was probably the Brady Bunch. And it was that was probably the beginning of me understanding camp and, uh, you know, growing up in suburbia and sort of seeing this uh, perfect reflection like this reflection of perfection that i knew was untrue and didn't exist um just uh really titillated me and it was definitely my the beginning of 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 not necessarily my storytelling obsession but more of like uh my gay obsession <laughs> and and looking at things through a slightly different lens um, so inspired to be filmmakers, you both met as freshmen at NYU Film School. Uh, what was that initial meeting like? What was it about the other person that was like, oh, you know what? I think we could make some magic together. No, that was not what happened at all. No? I think we both thought we were ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Randy actually had a Marsha Brady t-shirt on. Oh, how funny. Said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right, Randy? That... Yeah, it was hand-painted. Hand-painted t-shirt. I made it myself. I was like, it's like who hand paints their t-shirts? How how crazy is that? You know, but 
Um, but Fenton is very dismissive, but it's not true. We met like the first day of school in the lob lobby at NYU and we both were outsiders so clearly. Fenton had his hair up in a bun and was wearing diamond earrings and had on high top sneakers and like these leopard pants. I mean, he was a freak. He was a punk. He was exotic. And um, he like, I, I do think we connected instantly because we were outsiders. Mm. Um, and we collaborated very early on and, and we hid the extent of our relationship from our classmates for a while, but we eventually got busted. <laughs> And how. Uh, but I want to talk about also early career moves. Um, a pop a pop singing group? What was that about? <laughs> yeah, we were called the uh, Fabulous Pop Tarts. And we were sort of like um, the Pet Shop Boys, but only camper, if, that if that's possible. If that's imaginable, <laughs> yeah. But it was possible because we were it. <laughs> but the, the whole motive of joining the group or getting the group together was because you thought, oh, you could make all this money to make your films by being a pop group, right? Yeah, because Hollywood wasn't a very easy place to get into in those days, and independent film didn't really exist. And so that was our that was our thinking. And we slightly underestimated how hard it would be to have a string of big pop hits. So, <laughs> but I think I think Fenton's point about like uh, um, how difficult it was to break into Hollywood. It it just was not. It was like an old boy network, right? And um, our desire to kind of tell stories and to be filmmakers and like it really didn't seem like there was going to be any opportunity to do that. We were going to have to create some different entry point. It's so different. I mean, I think today it is truly different on so many levels, but that would that's definitely one of them. Well, I, and I want to talk about, you know, we're talking 30 years ago. What gave you the courage um, at, at that time, we know LGBTQ media looked different, even if there, there was any. Uh, but what gave you the courage to hit the industry out of the closet, kind of knowing that it would probably limit your voice, it would probably limit your career at that time? I, I mean, I don't think it was courage. I just think we were living our lives. Um, it's just who we were. And we were never in. And we were living in the East Village and we were surrounded by people who were insp who inspired us and who were all like out and just, they, it wasn't that they were out, they were just authentic. And so we didn't really know any other way. Um, it, was a, it was a real sort of crossroads culturally because you were, we were living in the East Village as Randy says, and all these artists and performers and Queens doing that thing. And then also at the same time, there was this sort of energy in New York and there was this East Village art scene out of which Jeff Koons came and, you know, Madonna came out of downtown as well. Suddenly, all this stuff was, was happening in downtown that wasn't just staying in downtown. It wasn't just on the margins. It was breaking through. So it was a real shift, conscious shift, I think, that culturally there was an opportunity like never before. In the course of, of your business relationship and everything that you've done, we know with being an owner of a business, especially in entertainment, uh, you share the losses, you share you share the wins, you share the blood, sweat, and tears. Some partnerships don't make it through. I and mean, I know that your uh, personal relationship with each other kind of shifted, but what have been the keys to maintain this successful, healthy business relationship through the last 30 plus years? Uh, <laughs> we would say this healthy relationship. We argue all the time. But that's good, <laughs> right? That's creative. I, I mean, I, I do think, I, I do think there is this thing about like not being able to pay rent. Like we, so much of uh, Fenton and my relationship, like the first 10 years of it, 12 maybe even, like we, we really struggled. And um, that brings you together in a way that, you know, we really know each other and we really know what we did to survive. And you experience, um, we have this kind of history that uh, um, just bounds us together. I mean, I also think to its slightly different extent, but, but similarly that 
that has a lot to do with our relationship with Rue because mm -hmm. we knew him back then as well. We were all sort of, you know, uh, struggling to get by and had dreams and ideas and believed what we were doing and what we had to say that there was a large, larger audience for it. Um, and yeah. when you go on that journey, you can't undo that. It's like, it's it's so great having that kind of journey in history with somebody. It really does feel like a kind of chosen family, you know? And yes. I think that that's true for tons of us in the LGBTQ plus community is that the sense of like, oftentimes that chosen family is more, the bonds are stronger than the family you're born into who may or may not accept you, uh, who may or may not see you. So. I think that Randy's right. And I think that that is very much the sort of vibe of World of Wonder that, that a lot of the people we work with were very fortunate because we've worked with them for years, like decades in some cases. Right. And so it does feel, I love that you put up that picture of, of Rue at the Emmys with all everybody around. Right. It, is like a, Village, it is like this big, I'm not gonna say one big happy family because it's not, and no family is, is a happy, kind of go lucky place it, but it's the, it's real and it, it it's it's a real it is it is like a chosen family i remember when the first season of drag race hit i was like oh wow this is great how fun never in my wildest imagination ever would i think yeah. that it would be so mainstream to the point that the idea of drag is is in households across the nation, around the globe, um, and now even straight households are now participating in this drag culture. Um, I, I want to know, uh, why do you think Drag Race has become so popular outside of our bubble? You know, Rue said it, you're born naked and the rest is drag. It doesn't matter who you are, man, woman, you know, you are, everything you put on is a statement about your identity. That is drag. Clothes are drag, you know. Vegas is the city in drag. Yeah, 100%. It's, uh, drag is everywhere and it's universally relatable. And, you know, I was, it was, it, there's a famous essay about camp. And Susan Sontag, I think, wrote this essay and said, Nothing in nature is camp. What is a giraffe? What is an octopus? What is a peacock? Like, and I could just go on for the rest of the entire uh, time that we have. You know, nature is incredibly camp, is incredibly gay. Um, <laughs> it is. And so, you know, it isn't so much that drag is, maybe it was seen once as a niche thing, but it's actually a universally relatable thing for everyone. And and specifically when it comes to RuPaul's Drag Race, like I, I would say there are three things that have made it so wildly successful and ha have been the sort of uh, fueled the growth of its success. One is RuPaul because he is kind of everything and right. he really does have a kind of um, a, a heart and a, a spirituality and a wisdom that that is he's always had and so he's the, our sort of leader and and you can feel that two are the queens and you you know they they we fall in love with this show it's a vehicle to 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 meet and connect and fall in love with 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 people and to recognize their artistry. So I think people do do that and people connect to them and they become part of their family. And then the third thing are the like the unbelievable talented people who make this show, many of whom have been there from day one. Tom Campbell, Stephen Korf, Mandy Zalansing, you know, Mish Mills. These are, these are, and there's so many more, Theron Smothers. I mean, I'd love to name all of them because they are, they, the world of wonder is about them and about their talents and about their artistry. And like, we try to surround ourselves with people who are um, more talented than we are <laughs> and, and as passionate as we are. Um, so that was too much, but, but it's, you know, it's worth spending a few minutes on it because like it is, it is unlike other shows out there. Like, yes, there's technically, there's a winner at the end of every se season and there's drama, but the show really is designed to, for people to get to know um, these amazing artists. And, and uh, you know, it was, it, the, the, this year, 
uh, you know, we just crowned Willow Pill as the winner and, you know, which is really special. And it, it, it's funny watching her, it, how much she kind of reminded me of like us in the East Village. Like mm. it, it really, I felt like this nostalgia. I felt, I felt I could feel my youth um, <laughs> reflected in some way. Um, and that, you know, that that feels kind of special because so much of what fuels everything we do comes from those hopeful, wistful, inspiring days in the 80s in the East Village. And even being nostalgic in that kind of time period, and this is with all of your projects, you, you seem to have your finger on the pulse of what's relevant, what's going to be popular, what's going to be relevant. And how do you do that? How do you keep ahead of, of what the cool kids are, are into nowadays? Uh, because you literally are uh, leading the times. You're ahead of the times. How do you keep your finger on that pulse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we really? do, but that's nice to hear. Like, I think they, like, Again, it's being surrounded by like, I think it has to do with being surrounded by so many talented people. I also think, by the way, drag, that's that's part of the engine of drag is to sort of be aware of everything around you and to kind of regurgi regurgitate pop culture. So, um, you know, I think it's more a reflection of the company we keep than mm. us. Mm. Oh, I, I, I like that. Um, I, I just have to know, uh, well, I had this conversation many different ways, uh, especially this last week. Despite the last administration we've been through and our current lawmakers looking to silence our community's voices, how do you explain the boom in openly LGBTQ entertainment, um, entertainers, and this boom of our stories? I mean, we now have gay Christmas stories on Hallmark. How do you explain that boom with that as a counterpoint to the crap we've been through recently and are still going through. Well, the crap we've been through and are still going through is is all based on the idea of like, you know, do you remember Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the 90s? 100%. The whole idea that you could be gay in the military, just don't say it, mm -hmm. just don't be public about it, don't be visible. But the problem with visibility is if you're, if you're invisible, you don't exist. And I think especially in the time that we're living in, which we, so much of our lives has to do with screens. We're on a Zoom now, mm -hmm. we'd be on our mobile phones, on our laptops, watching TV. You know, we're really in the screen age. And I think that the screen age is all about showing people, uh, other people who've normally been ignored or hidden or don't, whose existence hasn't been acknowledged. So I think the very time we're living in, funnily enough, lends itself to seeing the LGBTQ people, and, and that we have so much to give and contribute to, to this kind of society. So it's a weird thing to seeing these like attempts to dial it back or erase it, because it's, it's, look, it's not gonna work. It never has worked, it never will work. It's doomed to fail. Um, that's the exciting, that's the, that's the headline we mustn't lose sight of. And in looking back at the, the career and the material you've put out, what, in your memory was that kind of defining moment where it clicked and you're like, you know what? We're going to survive. We're going to be okay. We, we are making it and we've made it to this point. Was there that kind of one aha moment? Maybe it's right now on this interview hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're always driven by anxiety. <laughs> we, we suffer from starving kitty uh, uh, what, uh, some starving kitty uh, disease. Syndrome. Add a, yeah. add, say syndrome, okay. Randy. Yeah. Yeah. real. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> starving kitty syndrome. S SKS, is it? Is it oh, yes. There SKS. You go. Been SKS. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to know, as a content creator, too, uh, how do you know what to focus on? Because you've added the web series, you've added the podcast, you're adding new shows, you're working on films, uh, documentaries. How do you know really where to put your energy? Like, well, when no, do you it's sleep? Really, it's really all about storytelling, honestly, right. really. And it, it's not so much like, oh, well, this is a documentary or this is a feature film or this is a podcast. You know, we've always believed that it's about storytelling and the story will always tell you the way to tell it. You know, the story will tell you whether it should be a series or whether it should be 
a podcast or a webisode. It's, it, so it's not really, it's kind of all the same thing in a way. Yeah, I, I, it is kind of all the same thing. And also though, like in terms of like, how do we know what to, f- to, you know, where to focus our energy, what stories to tell, what to do. I mean, that that is, you know, partially that's, that's a challenge. Also partially like, um, I've lost my Are you doing your wordle, Randy? He's no, playing I'm wordle. Not doing my wordle. <laughs> no, I was just really thinking that you were talking about that. Like it, it is for World of like World of Wonder is an independent production company. Right. We're fiercely independent. We've never had um we've never borrowed money. We've never um had investors. And you know, we endlessly it reinvest it's it's apparently it's not a good uh business model like it's not the way the rest of the entertainment industry works industry works but for us it does work because it it we are just endlessly feeding our own passion and we're and you know there are a number of projects we've done that have made not not a penny um but we love having done them and and there's never enough time and energy. And we, you know, part of why we like success is to be able to create more opportunity. I, I don't know what Fenton saved me from this because I'm not, what is my point? I'm not making one, right? I'm just sort of, I'm not. Just do your own thing, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll edit this part out. No, no, no I thought that, no, that, that this is it, live. Yeah. Oh, th- th- this isn't live. Is did, you, did you win the Wordle today? Did you get it? <laughs> yes, I haven't lost for a while. Oh, oh. I didn't win it. No, but, know, but 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 I think you make a good point. It's it's having your own voice and being, you know, I, I need to be strong and you know, not take the easy way out. Like you said, you didn't have investors, you didn't have other voices. You both were telling uh stories from, from your point of view, distinctly from your voice. We know when it's a world of wonder project. We know that right away. But but the interesting thing is though that that with the growth of World of Wonder, with the growth of WoW Presents Plus. What's what's super exciting is that there's more opportunity, there's more voices, there's so many incredible ar- artists who inspire us, who we are would love to support and help um, produce more content with. But there's also on the flip side of that, there is the challenge. There's the challenge of time. There's the challenge of money. There's the challenge. So we're just endlessly fueled to keep growing things bigger because you know we have always you know. 20 years ago, we used to joke like our big ambition is to have our own network. So there could be, you know, drag queens on it 24 hours a day. People would laugh at us. But that's kind of where we are. Yeah. Right now. I mean, look at that. Look at that. And no matter what part of the world you want to. There, that's right. I mean, you know, the, the change in technology has been amazing because it's allowed so many of these things to be possible in a way that they just weren't. And it, it, it goes back to what we we're saying at the beginning. You know, starting out making films in the 80s, there really wasn't an independent film business. Right. You couldn't even do that. But now, like, you can do anything. You can just pick up the phone and do it. Grand and it's, cool. especially during COVID, you know, we had kids that were isolated in the Midwest somewhere, way out, not near, you know, a uh, uh, LGBT center or not near a club. But they were tuning into the content that that you all were created from the podcast, from the web series. And so people were able to not feel alone during well, that's, that time. Well, that, that is the miracle of the screen age. Yeah. You know, you can connect with people that aren't geographically right next door to you, that you don't meet in, necessarily meet in a bar. You can... And especially if you're in a family situation where, you know, maybe you're not supported by your family and if they knew you were gay, they would kick you out. But you can, thanks to the internet, thanks to the screen age, you can connect with all these people and watch all these shows. Like one of the shows that we did, um, the kind of COVID really had a shaping influence on it, was Painted with Raven, Mm, that's on Where It Presents Plus, because there, kids in their bedrooms compete in this makeup competition that Raven hosts. and it's all done remotely and it's amazing whether you wanted to or not you have both become activists with your work um and with the success comes all eyes on you uh with success you know can also come some some criticism i want to know how you handle the pressure of all the eyes being on you being politically and socially woke and correct um you know you're kind of 
can't really make a misstep. How do you deal with that kind of pressure or how does that monitor or censor the kind of stuff that you put out? Well, I think the, the, when we made the eyes of Tammy Faye hundreds of years ago, yes. um, the, uh, Tammy had an expression, she talked about running to the raw, which means not raw, R-A-W, yeah. uh, raw, R-O-A-R. So instead of like running from what you're afraid of, like run towards it and embrace it. And I don't know that we necessarily do that, but I think the whole thing is there's no point in letting that not everyone's going to like you and everyone's got an opinion and on twitter everybody has someone's got something negative to say and but fuck it right i mean <laughs> I just, love it. Don't, just don't let it bother you i think and what do you think that you've learned the most from each other <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I learned so much from Fenton because he's so smart. So, um, so I just like truly like I just learn. I learn. He's like smart in that way. So he's constantly uh, uh, sending articles or read this or read that. Like if I send him an article once a month, you know. But he's he just absorbs so much information. Um, that's one thing, and I've also learned not to hit send when I'm angry. Like Fenton oh, told Lord. me not to hit send after I write an angry email, even though sometimes I still do. That is a gift in itself, I will tell you. <laughs> oh, what have I learned from Randy? It's, it's, a, it's a lifetime, it really is. <laughs> you know, it's like... Translation nothing. It's, <laughs> no, translation everything, really. I, I mean, everything. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. I, I'm the, put it this way. I can't really imagine life without Randy. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine, you know, when I look back on it, like the meeting Randy that first day in film school, I had no idea, but, but it, none of this would have happened without meeting Randy. And so, you know, it's like a, you end up it, it, almost like you end up becoming extensions of each other, right. you know. Um, and so, so I just can't imagine. I, I I can't make you a long list of things I learned from Randy, but also I I can't imagine having lived this life without Randy. I mean, maybe there's a parallel universe where I don't meet Randy. Um, That's a very I, sad I, universe. I would sooner be in this one, really. <laughs> For listeners at home, tears are streaming down. <laughs> plop plop. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, I, I want to know what your uh, pride message is to your fans, especially now we're heading into pride season. Live events are back. We are now going to see each other face to face. What's your message to the community? You know what? I, I think at this time, we have more in common than what divides us. And, you know, yes, there are issues and there are conflicts within our community, but really fundamentally, what we're up against is so much bigger that really what we have in common far exceeds what divides us. And and I'm sometimes a little nostalgic for those 80s days when it was just everybody was sort of thrown together and we didn't really define each other or see each other as separate and distinct. Right. It wasn't like we were all sitting around saying Kumbaya or mm -hmm. braiding each other's hair, but there was just a, an acceptance that we were all in the same boat. And I think that that's kind of true today. And, and so I suppose as an extension of that, it's just being kind. You know, I think Twitter is such a toxic brew. And I think that it's just so important not to get triggered by that shit. Exactly. Because it's hard not to, you know. I, I second that. Like pride, have fun, be mm -hmm. kind, love one another, and <laughs> use all that energy, use all the stuff we have in common to 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 Whoops. yeah like like to focus on the real enemy because you know our community is is you know we're queer we're here we're great we're we and you know the thing is i think what people what straight people don't understand and those republicans in florida and what have you 
they don't understand that actually they're stuck in a closet too. 100%. And they have this malformed idea of what is expected of them or how they're supposed to be that isn't really who they are. And I think that the great thing that the queer community can demonstrate is that actually everybody's queer. You don't have to be gay, mm -hmm. but it helps. But it is like that thing that we have in common. And, and so being gay isn't, um, it, it's, yeah, everybody's queer. Every, even the straight people are queer. They just don't know it. That's right. And, and they have the most boring drag of all. <laughs> they do. God help them, they do, yes. <laughs> um, gentlemen, oh, and to that point, you know, what I love about the show is, you know, whenever there's a new cast announced or certain aspects have changed about the show, everybody's quick to judge. But what we've seen from episode to episode, because we get to see the behind the scenes, we get to see those touching moments that, you know, unless you're a robot, you are deeply touched by no matter what a circumstance you come to that story with. And so we see the haters evolve because we see uh, the person behind the makeup and for you to give that kind of opportunity. And so by the end of the season, it is kind of that kumbaya, you know, that excitement for that finale. And it's because we've worked through it, we've communicated. Um, and I love to see how that energy shifts uh, through the course. It's, 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 it's special. It's, it's so nice to hear you say that. I gotta say, working on the show it, it is so exciting because you really never know. You don't, you don't know where it's going, what's gonna happen. All your efforts to kind of produce things, it really comes down to the girls, their, their energy, their love, their connections, whatever. And, and it's, it's always a surprising and delightful trip. Gentlemen, I, I cannot thank you enough for uh, for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule to chat with us. Um, I cannot wait to see what the future brings. It was so lovely to talk to you. Thanks for having us. Thank you, gentlemen, and happy Pride. Happy Pride. <laughs> All right, everybody, better sissy that walk. That has been my chat with Randy Barbado and Fenton Bailey. You can read my in-depth article with them in the Pride issue of Metrosource, available on newsstands around the nation or at metrosource.com. And that's our episode. I'm your host and lead writer for Metrosource, Alexander Rodriguez. You can follow me on Instagram at Alexander's on air. Until next time, stay true and do you, boo. Happy Pride. I love that. That has been another Metrosource Mini. Like, share, and subscribe on your favorite podcast player and check out the latest issue of Metrosource Magazine on newsstands or online at metrosource.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram at Metrosource, and on Twitter at Metrosource Mag. Until next time, stay fabulous.